If ever we needed the Lord before, turn to your neighbor, say, we sure do need him now. All that's going on in our world, all that's going on around us, God knows we need Jesus like never before. Sing just that chorus one more time. Come on, I need. I need thee. thee I need thee. Every hour. Bless me now. Bless God. Come on and bless God. Hallelujah. 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 You better know you need him. <laughs> you better know you need him. Life will bring you to a place where you'll realize and recognize how much you need him. To Great God to thee. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Go ahead and be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank God for his presence in this place. Thank God for his presence in our lives. Hallelujah. Thank God he's real. I said he's real. Thank God for the ushers of our church. Appreciate them so much. Hallelujah. <laughs> Savior, oh Lord, I come to, to, to thee. Bless me now, my Savior, I come, I come, I come, Hallelujah. My God tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. And here's the good thing, Al. Never a time you need him that he doesn't show up. Never a time you call him that he's not there. Thank God for his faithfulness. Hallelujah. <laughs> Some things can't be programmed. You can't put them in the order of worship. You just have to let the Lord have his way. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Beloved, in 1896, tap a neighbor and say, that was a long time ago. Look back say, not even you were born then. In 1896, <laughs> in 1896 
a gentleman by the name of Alfred Bernard Noble passed away. In fact, the date of his death was December 10th, 1896. But Goldine, when Alfred Bernard Noble's obituary appeared in the next morning's paper, that would have been December 11th, 1896, it was not the first time, Tracy, his obituary had appeared in that paper. Several years earlier, Bruno, you probably know this, Alfred Bernard Noble's brother died. And the paper, uh, hearing of it, both of them were rather well known, confused the brothers and placed Alfred's obituary in the newspaper. Now, now what, was, what was significant about Alfred Bernard Noble, those of you who know the story, is that he was a very successful chemist and inventor. And one of the things that he had helped to invent, Reverend Nancy, was dynamite. And that dynamite had been used in wars and lives countless lives had been lost because of the invention of Alfred Bernard Noble. And on that day, some years before December 11th, when his obituary appeared in the paper, should have been his brother's, the paper condemned Alfred Bernard Noble as an merchant of death whose legacy would be the lives lost by his invention. When Alfred Bernard Noble read, watch this, read his obituary, he decided that is not how I want to be remembered. And so for the rest of his life, he gave away his sizable fortune in what we now know, 2017, as the Nobel Prizes. You've heard of the Nobel Prize for Peace, the Nobel Prize for Physics, the Nobel Prize for Literature. All of that, those prizes, awarded each year in the place where he lived, Stockholm. You'll remember Dr. King going to Oslo, going to Sweden to receive the Nobel Prize for Peace. Many of you will remember that former President Barack Obama in his first year received it. A lot of folk didn't think he deserved it, but he got it anyhow. The Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel Prize for Science, for Physics, for Literature, all of those prizes, Tammy, all of them, $1 million each awarded to the recipient, exist today because Alfred Bernard Noble read his obituary in the paper and decided, I don't want to be remembered as a merchant of death. And so he decided to give his money in a philanthropic endeavor that would mark the world long after he was gone. Now, beloved Angie, I, I hope, I hope none of you will ever read your obituary in the paper. <laughs> Uh, you know the joke as you get older, young people, um, Deacon Howard, they don't know this joke, but the joke as we get older is the first thing we do in the morning is get up, open the paper to the obituary column, and if our name's not there, we get out of bed. 
I hope none of you will ever have an Alfred Bernard Noble moment where somebody will mistake you for someone else and put your obituary in the paper. But here's what I do want to suggest is that all of us, now I don't want you to get scared. I don't want you to get paranoid. I don't want you to be looking over your shoulder. Does he know something I don't know? No, but all of y'all are going to die. Now, John, don't get too excited about that, okay? John, you know, John is an undertaker. I don't want him to get too excited about that revelation that all of us are going to die. We were born to die. We came here. Y'all getting quiet. We, the Bible tells us, Tyrone, that man, woman that is born of a woman is of a few days, and those days are full of trouble. We did not come here to stay. We came leaving. Y'all getting quiet on me. I know y'all don't want to hear it. I know you exercising, you pumping iron, you doing Pilates, but you're still going to die. Now, you'll be a good-looking corpse, but you're going to die. And here's the question. When that day comes, how will you be remembered? What will be your legacy? What will people say about you? I hope you don't have an Alfred Bernard Noble moment, but I do hope you have a wake-up moment where you realize, but chairman, that you're writing your obituary every day and that in ways large and small public and private seen and unseen all of us are not only writing but all of us are impacting somebody's life how many of you now, now I know it's, it's just September, but how many of you know that if life lasts uh, sometime in December, you're going to watch It's a Wonderful Life? We all do. We all watch it. And we love it, you know, uh, when, when, when uh, what's the guy's name, Henry, you know, wants to die and says there's nothing to live for. And then the angel takes him around and shows him how different, Tracy, the world would be without him. Do you know, I know you don't think about it because you think, like most of us think, that unless you're a millionaire or unless you're a movie starlet or unless you're a high financier, or unless you're somebody popular or powerful that your life doesn't make a difference but I got up tonight to tell you that you don't need a lot of money and you don't need to be popular and you don't need to be powerful the fact you're alive means you are touching somebody else's life would you look at a neighbor and say neighbor your life matters no, nah, you didn't tell the right neighbor. Look back, say, neighbor, your life matters. You're touching somebody. You're impacting someone. There's a child. There's an adult. There's an older person. This church really would not be the same without each and every one of you. In fact, turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, if you weren't here tonight, nobody would be sitting in that seat. Do you see how important you are right now? I have somebody to preach to because you showed up. Your life matters. Your life makes a difference. And in reality, Reverend Nancy, that is the essence of what Paul writes when he writes to the church at Philippi, particularly in the text that we're looking at tonight. Because what Paul is saying to them, and it's what I want to do as I wrap up the series this weekend for this month on a new and better you, I want to talk about, are you ready for this? The presence of a new and better you. The presence. The difference your presence makes in the world. Because listen to what Paul says, Sister Jerry. Paul says, I want you, no matter who you are, to realize and recognize 
how important you are. Listen to how he says it. I want you to shine like stars in the midst of a wicked, crooked, and perverse generation. Boy, you missed it. I want you. Paul says, I know, I know you're not popular. I know you're not famous. I know you're not rich. But here's what I know. The presence of a believer in the world makes a difference. Okay, okay, y'all miss it. Now, Cousin Carolyn, I'm telling you on your job. As a matter of fact, Cousin Carolyn, I just called her name. For years, everybody say years. For years, Cousin Carolyn worked at Grand Hospital. And uh, she, she ran Grand Hospital. Especially that surgical area. She ran that, boy. She ran that. And whenever I'd go visit, I don't get to visit as much as I used to, but when I'd go visit Grand Hospital, inevitably I'd run into Carolyn and her cohorts. And they would always tell me how much they loved Carolyn and what she meant to them. And when she retired, they, I would go in and they'd say, we sure miss Carolyn. And I could say that about many of you when I've had the opportunity to run into folk who know you. Here's what you don't realize. Your presence on your job has made a difference. Your presence in your neighborhood on your block makes a difference. Your presence in your community makes a difference. Your presence in this church makes a difference. And what you need to realize is you're not just here by accident, sucking up air, taking up space. God has planted you and placed you in this world at this particular time for a reason and a purpose. And your presence is making a difference. And that difference makes all the difference in the world. I was in um I was in my in one of my favorite stores last night. Okay, y'all divided. Somebody said Apple. <laughs> what was the other one they said over here? Walmart. It's my favorite store. I would I do more evangelism and pastoring in Walmart than I do anywhere else. Sometimes I don't want to buy them. I just go in there and stand around and they just come to me. And I was, I was in Walmart uh, picking up, you know, first ladies out of town. So you know what I was doing, right? Picking up pre-cooked stuff. <laughs> and uh, so I was shopping for pre-cooked stuff. And I was, you know, talking to the, um, to, to the cashier. And, and a lady turned around. She said, Bishop Clark. I said, yes, yes. And she said, I knew that was you. She said, I heard you talking, and I knew that's got to be him. Nobody has a voice like that. And I said, oh, thank you. Then she turned to the lady. She said, that's him. And, the, and then this one was funny. The lady was so incredulous. She's like, who? <laughs> She's like, who? He said, Bishop Clark. She said, uh-huh. She said, his voice. She said, mm-hmm. I'm like, come on, push the cart. We got to go. <laughs> It humbles you, you know. <laughs> Your presence makes a difference. You have a voice like no one else. You have a touch like no one else. You have a heart like no one else. Your presence makes a difference, and the difference makes all the difference. Which is why you should stop trying to be a copy of somebody else. Stop running around trying to be a, a you know, a, a, a copy of this person and a carbon copy of this person and, and a facsimile of that. When God made you, he broke the mold. Now, I know some folk want to shout just on that, but I'm serious. When God made you, do you know what God said when he made you? He looked at you and said, I will never do that again. Now, you take that any way you want to, but that's what he said. I will never do that again. And if this world lasts another million years, there'll never be another you. And Paul says, because you're different, 
Now, I could go into the theological part of this, Al, that we are different because Christ is in our lives. Paul assumes that he's writing to the church. He's writing to Christians. Of course, they're different because of that. And he says, now, Sharon, since you're different, here's what I want you to do. I want you to show forth that difference. And there are three ways. I'll deal with one tonight, two tomorrow. And the way you do it tonight, and you'll be off the hook tomorrow for the other two. No, you won't. Get to CD. Um, is you shine. Tap a neighbor say, you shine. When I was a little boy, I know it was a long time ago. When I was a little boy, we used to sing that song. This little light of mine. Oh, y'all saying that too. I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go. All in my home. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Y'all left me out here by myself. Let it shine. And Tracy, that's what Paul says. Paul says that one of our responsibilities is because we're different, because Christ has made a difference in our lives, we are to, everybody holler, shine. Come on, that's your job. Now, you remember that song, right? Because there was one little, you know, how they, I, now I used to hate this. They, them old ladies make you pantomime. Ugh. I hate it. I didn't want to sing it. Then they want to make you act it out. Hiding under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Ixnay, Ixnay. Not hiding under a bushel, Paul. But that's what Paul says. Paul says, you don't hide it under a bushel. That's what Jesus says. You let your light so shine before men and women that they see your good works and give glory not to you but to the Father. No one, Jesus says, lights a candle and puts it under a bushel but puts it on a lampstand so that it gives light to everybody. Tell your neighbor, say, let your light shine. And there are three ways you do that. I want to look at three ways that you and I let our light shine because that's what we're called to do. Paul says, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Man, isn't our world dark? No, y'all missed it. I said, isn't our world dark? Okay, I'm going to try one more time. Isn't our world dark? I mean, from North Korea to 1600 Pennsylvania, in our world dark, Mexico and Puerto Rico and Kirks and Keiko said, you just got out. You know, I was praying for you stuck down in there. The world is so dark. There's upheaval and there's disruption and there's uncertainty. Listen to what Paul says. In the midst of all of that, that is not the time for the church to be timid and shy. Let your light shine. And watch this, y'all, and I'm going to move on. Can you imagine? And our crowd is considerably down because of the women's retreat. But can you imagine if just the folk who are in here tonight would go out starting Monday, letting their light shine? Deacon Judge Letts sent me an article. I read it by David Brooks, great writer. His uh, treatment of hurricanes, earthquakes, and what they say about not just natural order, but what they say about the geopolitical, socioeconomic order was just spellbinding. It's, it's a great article. It's a great article. And he talks about the fact, this is one of the things he says, is that when disasters like this strike, it is not just for the individual to respond. It is an opportunity for the collective humanity to respond, for us to do something that will change stuff. And that's the job of the church, beloved, to do something that will change things, to light a candle rather than curse the darkness. So how do you do that? There are three ways. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, how's your light shining? Matter of fact, look back, say, neighbor, I think your batteries are dead. <laughs> you like them flashlights in my house, don't none of them come on. <laughs> Here's the first way. 
We let our light shine boldly. Let the whole church say boldly. boldly. Online, come on, say boldly. boldly. I, I listened recently um, to a message by Alistair Begg, who's one of my favorite. I love Alistair Begg. I think I, I, think I love his accent as well as his insight in scripture. Alistair Begg is just, he passes down the road in Cleveland. He's a white British preacher. I love the way he's from Scotland, I think. And um, in this message, he was talking about much the same thing that we are dealing with tonight. And this is what he said. I wrote it down. He says that when we come to Christ, listen to this. This is what Alistair Beck said. We forsake sin. I knew that. Self. I knew that. I grew up in the church of God. I could have taught him that. We, we good on teaching forsaken sin and self. But then he threw one in. It caught me off God. He said, and we forsake sin secrets. That's what I said. And watch what he says. And what he meant by secrets, Goldine, is that we do not for the sake, now this is not him, I'm, I'm saying it the way I heard it. We do not for the sake of conformity or comfort or to fit in or to be accepted, hide who we are in Christ. We do not live secret Christian lives. I, now, now, here's the thing. Now, now deacons, all, all my deacons stand, please. Would all my deacons stand? Need to see those who are here tonight. All my deacons stand. Thank you. Keep standing. Thank you. All right. Now, now mess with me. They're going to get you. <laughs> because I'm about to thank you, deacons, because I'm about to say something. And I know y'all going to try to bum rush me, but they're going to tackle you if you do. Watch this. I know you shout in here. I know you cut a step in here. I know you take victory laps in here. I know you praise in here. All of us know you's a Christian. Does anybody on your job know you're a Christian? We, we, we got it. We got it. You, we got it. We know you is. But does anyone else know you are? And Alistair Begg says, when I come to Christ, I forsake sin. We all know that. Self, we all know that. But he also said, and we forsake secrets. We are not undercover incognito saints. When no one knows we're Christians but us in God. And if there's one thing our world needs tonight, it's the bold light of bold Christians. Unashamed, unapologetic, unabashed. Let me give you three ways. What, what does that look like? When you're, when you're letting your light shine boldly, here's the first thing. You will not succumb to peer pressure. Doesn't matter what anybody else does. Look, I got one amen and three grunts. It, it does not matter what anyone else does. When you are bold in letting your light shine, you will not succumb to peer pressure. Here's B. When you are letting your light shine boldly, you will be willing to suffer persecution. Now, they may not throw you in prison. They may not beat you up, but they'll talk about you. They'll feed you with a long handle spoon. They won't invite you to their functions. And if you need and crave all of that, then you'll quiet, you know, sort of what uh, I've quoted him so many times, the late Dr. Ernest Campbell, who pastored Riverside Church uh, there in Harlem, New York, talked about the church, and he said one time that the tragedy, you've heard me quote it, you can quote it with me, that the tragedy of the church is we lower our voice to raise our budget. We get quiet when we ought to speak out. We're not afraid of persecution. We don't give in to peer pressure. Here's C. We take a stand even when it carries a price. That's how you let your light shine bold. You uh, take a stand even if it has a price tag attached to it. Here's the second thing. How's the first way we let our light shine? We let our light shine boldly. Here's the second way. We let our light shine. I laughed when I wrote this down. I said I ought to come up with a better, I think I invented this word. Um, we ought to let our light shine believably. Is that a word? 
It is? Okay, good. I didn't make it up. I thought I made it up. I was going to baptize it, consecrate it, and send it out there. We, we, we let our light shine believably. Now, here's what I mean, Al. So often, we lose non-believers, church. I don't know why my, my grandchildren won't come to church. I don't know why I be inviting my friends to church. They don't come. I be telling my, my cousins they ought to come to church. They don't come. And, and, and here's one of the reasons why. Now, please don't get me. I remember these deacons up here. Here's why. Because you're not believable. You're not believable. Okay, I'm sorry. We're not believable. I shouldn't throw you out under the bus. We're not believable. We're not believable. You know, we talk a good talk. We don't often have anything to back it up with, though. And one of the ways you let your light shine is you don't just let it, Deacon Renard, shine boldly. You let it shine believably. Okay. Okay. I'm going to say it again. Everybody better say amen. We let our light shine believably. I'm going to give you three ways you do that. Are you ready? Here's the first way. Um, we let our light shine in a personal way. In a personal way. You know, I talked about this Wednesday night, that we've got to get away from this exclusion, that, I, you know, I'm out here by myself, but we're a part of the church. But we also, uh, some, someone said, um, uh, Deacon Logan, that, that salvation is personal, but it's not private. There's a difference, you know. It's personal, but it's not private. And, and so, so I must be believable, watch this, at a very personal level. Which means I can't be Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. I can't be Sybil. Not Rem Nancy Sybil. The, you know, Sybil in the movies. You know, who's got all these personalities? You, you can't, you know, I was talking to a bishop the other day, and, and I, he said something about the person. I said, I said, who are you talking about? He told me, I said, who's that? And he told me, and I said, oh, I know who it is. I said, the only reason I'm saying that is because every time I meet him, I want to ask, and who am I meeting today? Because there are so many of them. One day you meet them, they're nice, and next day you meet them, they're mad. Next time I see them in a revival, you know, they criticize everybody. The next time you see I'll be like, you know, oh, so just tell me, who today am I talking to? There has to be a quality of consistency in your life and in my life. Everyone has bad days. Even I do. Pop white, even I do. I know y'all don't believe it. Believe me, I do. There are some days I don't want to come here. There are some Saturdays I don't want a pretty day like this. Come on now. There are some Sundays I want to stay in bed. There are some days I don't want to be bothered. But I am not going to allow my emotions and my feelings to dictate my actions. I have to have consistency in my life. Are you in the room with me? So tell a neighbor in a personal way. All right, here's the next one. I know you're not going to like this one. In a practical way. Let your light shine practically. All right, all right, here it is. I got one for you. Pay your bills on time. Let me tell you what I hate. Let me tell you, let me tell you what I don't like. I don't like y'all having them long spiritual recordings on your phone and the bill collector calling. One of the members, what, they're not here anymore, but one of the members told me one time that she took hers off because she had that on there and she said she got home in the afternoon and the bill collector said, yeah, Jesus does say, but could you pay your bill? To you. He does, praise the Lord. All of that stuff you was quoting, but could you get us our money? Somebody say, be practical. Just be practical. Be nice to people. Speak to people. Stop speaking in tongues and don't talk to the person in church. Come on, stop that. Stop that. Be nice. It doesn't cost you anything. To be. Everybody say, practical. 
All right, here's the third way. Y'all be like, please move on. What's the first way? We let our light shine in, eh? We let our light shine in. And then here's the one. I'm, I'm making up another word, I think. We let our light shine in provable ways. In a, prov- in a way that can be proven. It can be validated. It can be verified. Here's what I mean. Folk can track it and trace it. You know, you be talking all this stuff. But here's the thing. If my memory, if somebody followed you home, I often wonder what would happen um, if the people we witnessed to and tell them to come to my come to my church, hear my bishop. I wonder if they if they just said, you know what, I'm gonna follow them home and just see how they act. Come on. You got to let your light shine in a way that's believable. In a way that people say, you know what? I've watched them personally. I've seen them in very, nothing deep, remnant, just practical ways, son. And I can say one thing. They have proven to be children of God. Rob, I I don't know anything better than letting your light shine. Everybody say believably. Let me close. Here's the last one. We must let our light shine. Everybody say biblically. Now, 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 here's what I mean by this, and I'll close. Um, uh, Sister Jerry, so often we have seen people, well-meaning people, I'm sure, well-meaning people who ride a hobby horse. Y'all know what a hobby horse is? You know, I, I keep realizing, I, Deacon George, Mary, I, I've been telling y'all, I got to come up with some new illustrations because I'm old and all my illustrations are old. Y'all don't know what a hobby horse is? Okay, some of y'all do a hobby horse. You know, one of them horses that you get on it and you just be going and going and going. And, blah, 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 blah. and then when you stop an hour later, you're still in the same spot. <laughs> you don't work up a good sweat, but you haven't gone anywhere. People ride hobby horses. It can be anything all the way, Faye, from makeup to the eschatology of the church. The valley, the battle in the valley of Megiddo. They go from makeup to Megiddo. And they ride a hobby horse. And uh, every time you see them, you know they're gonna they're gonna talk about makeup. What's wrong with the church today? All these women with this massacre on, wearing all this war paint. Child, I tell you, the church is going down. Church going. That's just their hobby horse. They just, and they wear that horse out, child. Other people, man, they talking about the valley, battle in the valley of Megiddo and blood up to the, to the, to the, to the legs of the horses. And now I tell you, I ain't thinking about these folk. I ain't thinking about Trump because I know in the millennial reign in Megiddo, this ain't going to matter. That's all they talk about. Makeup or Megiddo. Somewhere in between. It's all they talk. They just ride that hobby horse. And they think when they do that, here's the sad part, they being biblical. But beloved, letting your light shine biblically doesn't mean you take a scripture and beat folk over the head with it. Especially when you take it out of context. Can I get an amen from somebody? So, so watch this. What I've got to do then is I have to find a paradigm. I have to find a model. I have to find an example. And here's the good news, y'all. I don't need to look any further than Jesus. So when I want to know how do I let my light shine in a biblical way, all I got to do is look at the man from Nazareth and ask how did that ghetto preacher handle being the light of the world? Because you know he did say, I am the light of the world. And if he's the light of the world, I need to find out what did that dude do? Because I won't be like him. And there are three things. Are you ready? Tap a neighbor and say, you ain't ready for Jesus. No, you ain't ready for Jesus. Here's the first way. Here's the first way you let your light shine biblically. By caring about people. Boy, boy, I'm so sick of y'all caring about buildings and denominations and positions and titles. 
Here's why, and, and, and mother, you, I'm so glad you're here tonight. You can pray me through this. Here's why, because Jesus is not coming back for any of that. Boy, I wish I had a church right here. No, he's not coming back for this building. He's not coming back for your title. He's not coming back for your position. He's not coming back for who you think you are. He's coming back for a church without spot, without wrinkle, a church that is founded on him. Stuff we fight over doesn't mean a thing to Jesus. He could care less about it. Upon this rock, I build my church. Gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that carpenter from Nazareth went around for three and a half years caring about people. And I'm scared of your religion if it allows you to love Jesus and not love people. I'm scared of that. I'm scared of that. I'm scared of that. Sister Jerry, I'm scared of that. I'm scared of folk who are so Jesus lovers and care nothing about people. You got a kid. You're going to let your light shine biblically. You care about people. Here's B. It sounds like the same, but believe me, it isn't. You care for people. One is attitude. The other is action. I care about you, that's my attitude. I care for you, that's my action. Which means I am willing to do whatever I got to do to help you and to bless you. Y'all getting quiet. I done lost all my shouters on a Saturday night. No, y'all, if I care about you, I'll care for you. I won't see you hurting and not try to help you. I won't see you down and not try to lift you. I won't see you sad and not wrap my arms around you. I won't see you discouraged and not try to speak a word of life to you. I won't see you hungry and not feed you or naked and not clothe you. There's no way I can care about you and I don't care for you. All right, all right, let's go to work. That's where I fall out with a lot of my evangelical brethren who have a two-string theological guitar and two of them are broken. Abortion and gay rights. That's all they know. Abortion. Gay rights. They march with pictures of fetuses. They bomb abortion clinics. They talk about homosexuals in such nasty, low-down, despicable ways. All the time singing on with Christian soldiers. Y'all ain't helping me. And it bothers me because sin is sin. Y'all ain't helping me. And smoking and drinking... And lying and backbiting. Just lump them all in the same category. And they down and damn people who've had abortions. We believe in, 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 in the beginning of life is that conception. We believe in the sacredness of the way, and I do too. But my God, how can you say you care about a fetus? And don't give a rip about the child once it gets here. Y'all ain't helping me. We got a president who is trying to dismantle every social agency and every social service. And yet we want to talk about abortion and the right to life. We got to talk about life not just in the womb, but life after the womb. don't just care about people you care for people I'm going to close and I'm going to say this and I'm going to leave we care about people we care for people Jesus is the model for that 
He's the paradigm for that. He's the example of that. But you know what else that dude did? That preacher from the ghetto, you know what else he did? In his working with people, he showed he cared, my God, whether they were lepers or prostitutes. God, I wish I had a church up in here. Whether it was blind Bartimaeus or the woman at the well, whether it was a man with palsy or whether it was Nicodemus coming at night, he cared about people and he cared for people. And I'm going to close on this one, y'all. And he didn't care what some folks said about it. Because as long as you're concerned about folk flapping their jaws and what they think about you, you'll never do what you ought to do. But they said about Jesus, he hangs with publicans and sinners. He's a wine bibber. He hangs around sinners. He's a no good this and he's a no good that. But Jesus said, oh, y'all don't understand. Folk who are well don't need a doctor. I didn't come to help folk already saved. I came to seek and save that which was lost. All right, come on. Let's go to work, y'all. Look at a neighbor. Say, neighbor, I am so glad he didn't leave me like he found me. I am so glad he didn't leave me in the mess I was in and the muck I was in and the mire I was in. Is there anybody here who can shout with me? I was sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the water lifted me safe am I turn to a neighbor say neighbor love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help It's 7-Eleven. I gotta go. My time is up. Tell a neighbor, love. Look beyond my soul and show my neighbor, say neighbor. Let your light shine. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed, every heart is praying. I want you to search your heart. Bible says, let a man, let a woman examine themselves. I want you to ask yourself, how am I doing in this shining department? My whole thesis, my homiletical thesis based on my hermeneutic of this text is the presence of believers makes a difference. That's the sermon in a sentence. When I went to my study this week, last week, working on this, that's the sentence I worked from. The presence of a believer makes a difference. <laughs> that's, that's the whole, that's my whole theological thesis. The presence of a believer makes a difference. Among whom you shine as lights in the world in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Let your difference make a difference. Wow. And what a difference it makes. Would you search your heart? Online church, online. I'm looking at the right camera, online. Would you search your heart? Ask yourself, how am I doing in letting my light shine? Am I letting it shine boldly? believably, biblically how am I doing with that while we sing a little bit of this song everybody pray, come on love lifting come on everybody pray yes, love
Father, thank you for your amazing grace and your astounding love. This kind of love I cannot understand. The Father's love from heaven's own right hand. I do believe it will take eternity to solve this mystery of love so grand. Thank you for your love. Would you help us this week as we step into a new week tomorrow, help us to let our light shine in a bold way, in a believable way, and God, please, in a biblical way. Don't let us confuse the world about who you are. Don't let us send the wrong message, give off the wrong signal. Help us to represent you well so that folk will see our good works and give glory to you. Thank you for my neighbor to my left and my right. We're workers together. We're all in the family. So I pray for them while they pray for me. And I thank you what you're doing. In Jesus' name.